The last step in discussing the Constitution is going to be looking at the debates over ratification of the Constitution. So we're going to spend some time looking at the different arguments of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, and we're going to focus on a couple of the important Federalist papers. So mainly today we want to be able to describe the arguments that were made by the Federalists, and so they're using these arguments to explain why the Constitution is a better plan for government. And that's what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to explain why the United States Constitution is a better plan for the states than the Articles of Confederation. So we're going to get those arguments from Federalist number 10 and from Federalist number 51 today. So first, let's make sure that we're all on the same page about what the Federalist Papers are. So we've got a variety of essays written by a couple of our big time uh, founders, Hamilton and Madison, and they're explaining why the Constitution ought to be ratified. Officially, the Federalist Papers, we would use them, they're a series of essays that advocate for the support of the Constitution and urge the state governments to ratify the Constitution. At the time, these were written anonymously. Um, the identity of the authors really was a secret at the time. These were showing up in pamphlets and other forms of written communication throughout the colonies. And so each of these uh, Federalist papers or each of these essays argues a different point of discussion about the Constitution. So each one takes on a different topic about the design of the Constitution and explains why this new form of government would be a more desirable form of government than what the Articles of Confederation was. The most famous of the Federalist Papers is Federalist 10 and then probably Federalist 51, and that's two of the Federalist Papers that we're going to look at today. These are two of our required documents that we have to make sure we understand for the AP exam. The authors of the Federalist Paper we know today, uh, we're going to really focus on Hamilton and Madison, but the three main authors would be Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. They're arguing in favor of expanded central government. They're arguing in support of the Constitution. We know James Madison is going to support the Constitution because he designed the Constitution. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is another guy who advocates for a lot of central government control so that it can better like can, uh, plan the economy and things like that. Hamilton wrote the most of the Federalist Papers. He wrote more than 50 of the Federalist Papers. Later in the year, we'll look at Federalist 78. That's his most famous. James Madison wrote 26 of the Federalist Papers, and he wrote the two important ones that we're going to look at today. These are the most famous of the Federalist Papers, number 10 and number 51. And then there's John Jay, and we're going to forget about John Jay. So the point of the Federalist Papers was to encourage the state governments to ratify the Constitution. It's to encourage those states to get to the 9 out of 13 approval threshold. Um, and so if they actually had any impact is questionable today. So I want to look at uh, where the Federalist Papers were published and uh, what you know, what the situation was there to determine if they really had any impact on ratifying the Constitution. For starters, the Federalist Papers were printed only in New York, so only people in New York are seeing them. Uh, we've talked about how nine of the 13 states had to ratify the Constitution, but really, if New York and Virginia rejected the Constitution because they were such big and powerful states, we would not have actually been able to put this plan into effect. As it turns out, nine states ratified before Virginia and New York. So technically, the Constitution was already the law of the land by the time uh, New York ratified here. Uh, Virginia was actually the 10th state to ratify. New York was the 11th. So technically, they weren't even needed. Um, and then we can also look at who was chosen to serve in New York's ratification convention. And they chose twice as many anti-federalists than federalists. So uh, this does not seem to have had a lot of impact on the decision makers in New York at the time. Also, we're talking about the 1780s. We're talking about newspapers in one state. And so uh, the, the actual audience here is not to try to persuade the public because this has almost no impact on the public. So how these are actually used is that these would be like talking points or like guides for people who would be debating during the ratification convention. 
So uh, people that were elected to the ratification convention could read these documents and then they would know the best arguments to make for each of the different parts of the Constitution. So that, that was the main intention of the authors here is to give the, the people serving in the ratification convention some kind of guide as to what, could, what they could say. But obviously, you know, these, these are things that the curriculum demands that we teach you guys in 2020. So let's look at why these are important today. Uh, today, we've, we've talked about how the Constitution is short and how the Constitution is vague and it leaves a lot open for debate. Uh, and so the Federalist Papers were written by the same people. So the Federalist Papers give us a like pretty good idea of what the original intentions of the people writing the Constitution was. So, for example, we know that Article 3, we've talked about Article 3 a lot at this point, it does not give any powers to the courts. But if I read Article 78, I mean, if I read Federalist Paper 78, I know that the basic idea for the courts was to have judicial review and to monitor the other branches. So this helps us uh, flesh out what the framers intended for the government to, to function like. There's a lot of philosophy in these documents. There's a lot of uh, explaining what the different parts of American democracy are. And so much like the Declaration of Independence, we don't actually care about the document for its like original purpose, but we use it now as a source of what is the political philosophy of the United States. And then even though these are not the Constitution, they are like a source of constitutional law. So the Supreme Court, when they're coming up with their opinions, even in 2020, they can consult the Federalist Papers and they can find more meaning to the words in the Constitution based on what's written in the Federalist Papers. So the Supreme Court has relied on the Federalist Papers more than 300 times in different decisions that they've issued. And so they do still have like impact and effect today.